This is the Read to Lead podcast, episode 420. Stop trying to hold your team accountable. You're actually preventing them from performing. Instead, hold them capable. You know, that may sound like semantics, but it's subtly and profoundly different all at the same time in that when we hold our team capable, we confront, but we don't confront out of the gate with consequences. We confront with freedom, freedom of choice. Personal accountability is the bedrock upon which all sustained success in life is built. Yet what if nearly everything we've been taught about accountability is wrong? What if the prevailing notions of holding someone accountable and being held accountable are impossible, and instead of driving accountability, actually undermine it? Hi there, I'm Jeff Brown, and this is the Read to Lead podcast. It's the podcast that's dedicated to your personal and your professional growth, and the belief that if you want to experience true success in your business and in your life, that intentional and consistent reading is where to start. Today, we are joined by authors Brian Moran and Michael Lennington co-authors of one of my all-time favorite productivity books called The 12-Week Year, and they've got a brand new book out called Uncommon Accountability, a radical new approach to greater success and fulfillment. I'll be asking Brian and Michael to share about what it means to have an accountable mindset, how to create as a leader an accountable shadow, what leveraging the uncomfortable looks like, and much more. If you want to make sure you keep up with the latest episodes of the Read to Lead podcast, get my reading tips and tips on taking better notes, keeping track of those notes, and then doing something with those notes, sort of personal knowledge management type concepts, then you want to make sure you're on my email list. If you haven't yet joined it, you can go to my website, readtoleadpodcast.com, and just enter your first name and email address in the form at the upper right of the page. I'll also send you a free ebook called Dream Big, the five personal habits that will supercharge your life. Again, that's readtoleadpodcast.com. And then fill out the form in the upper right of the page, and you're good to go. One more time, that's readtoleadpodcast.com. Brian Moran is the founder and CEO of The Execution Company, an organization committed to improving performance and enhancing the quality of life for leaders and entrepreneurs. Michael Lennington is vice president of The Execution Company and an expert in implementing lasting change in organizations. Their new book is called Uncommon Accountability, A Radical New Approach to Greater Success and Achievement. I have been wanting to interview these guys for for quite a while, ever since their last book, The 12-Week Year, uh, came out. And I just learned that I can interview them about that, too, if I want, even though it's been out for a while. Uh, Brian Moran, welcome to the show. Glad to have you here. Thank you. Great to be here. And Michael Lennington as well. Thank you for being here. Great as well. Yeah, thank you. Well, let me start with with a definition, and uh, let me go to Michael with this first question. Uh, describe how uh, uncommon accountability differs from the traditional way we tend to think about accountability. Yeah, that's a great question. There's, in our view, there's there's really two kind of definitions of of accountability, and there's an intuitive definition that we all kind of gravitate to when people think about being successful. They realize accountability is part of that journey. Being more accountable leads to greater success in life, and and very rarely is somebody who's unaccountable successful. And so people intuitively understand that, and yet. The way that the, the uh, concept of accountability gets applied is based upon a different understanding. You go to the uh, dictionary, uh, online dictionaries, and you can see that most of the examples that they show are, are negatives, where somebody has done something wrong, almost implying that they did it intentionally. And then somebody with more power comes in and punishes the person with less power because they did something wrong. And so that's that's the view of accountability in a lot of people's minds as well, is this, this, this consequence management process, where if you do well, you get positive consequences. And if you do poorly, you get negative consequences. And those two those two definitions of accountability are polar opposites because one has has the individual who realizes that they have free will choice to either do the things they need to do or not do the things to be successful. And the other one is that somebody's sort of taken over that choice and said, here, I know what's best for you. If you do those things, you're going to get rewarded. If you don't, you're going to get negative consequences. And you know, Brian's going to add a lot more to that, I think. But that's basically, in my view, the, the, dichot- the difference between the two definitions in our view. Yeah, we, we look at, a, at accountability not as, as consequences, but as ownership, which is the empowering part of accountability. <laughs> I mean, that's the piece that makes it so empowering and so impactful. The reason that the consequences equating to accountability definition is so prevalent is because consequences do shape behavior and leaders understand that and they use it to shape behavior. There's some downside to it. There's some short-term benefit for some, some long-term costs. 
I remember when reading uh, the 12 week year and the chapter on accountability as ownership and thinking at that time, gosh, it seems like there might be another book there. And so I was pleasantly surprised when, when that turned out to, to be the case. Uh, well, Brian, let me go to you on this next one. Expound on this idea that, that the quality of our choices determines the quality of our life. I'm beginning to see this everywhere. I'm interviewing next week, Mark Miller, who is the executive vice president of high performance leadership at Chick-fil-A. And his new book is called Smart Leadership, Four Choices to Scale Your Impact. I'm hearing more and more talk about the importance of choice uh, as it determines our quality of life. What would you say to that? Yeah, if you think about accountability as ownership, it's it's founded on the on the fact that we have free will choice, that we always have choice, right? No matter what the situation is. Now it doesn't doesn't mean I'm always gonna like the choices. We like to joke that, you know, in the States anyways, April 15th rolls around and you can you got the choice of paying your taxes or going to prison. But <laughs> personally I don't like either one of those. But you do have choice and and which leads to this notion the quality determines the quality of your life. So the recognition that you know I don't control the circumstance, I don't necessarily control what happens to me, but I do control how I respond. And so just to be in mindful, just knowing that and then being mindful of am I making productive choices in the key areas of my life, whether it be my relationships, my career, you know, my health or whatever it is. Anything you'd add, Michael? I agree with what Brian said. I think that choice between taxes and, and going to prison is neither <laughs> one is a positive choice, right? And sometimes we don't have great choices. Um, but generally, when we have choices, Brian points out, we feel more in control. And and often, the, there is one better choice. And and so it's just being focused on what you can control versus what, what you can't. Michael, talk about this tendency that many of us seem to have to sort of play the victim with regard to what we experience in life uh, to, to attribute a greater role than we should maybe to external factors that are out of our control? Yeah. I mean, w- w- there's a lot of reasons why people people do that. Um, one of the primary ones though is this, this need to protect my ego, protect myself, sense of self-efficacy. And so when I can blame something else for someone else for a failure in my life, I don't have to confront the fact that, that I contributed to that failure. In fact, there may be on other players. I mean, there may, there's events and people can get in the way and, and cause us to stumble. But what ends up happening is that if I, if I attribute all the power to those external factors, I can't change it. So I'm powerless and I'm, and I'm blaming others. It's backwards looking. And what we really want to have people do is think about what's next, not what just happened. And, and given what you where you are, what's the best choice from this point forward? And that's really about the things you control which is thinking in actions versus other people in events. And Brian, I'd like to get your response to that, but also to have you contrast that with the accountable mindset, sort of compare and contrast, if you would. Yeah. You know, the, the, the victim mindset is very much about protecting my ego and it tends to be rear view mirror, right? I'm looking back and trying to shift blame or shift responsibility where the uncommon accountable mindset is different. It's really not about blame at all. Mm-hmm. It's just about how to get better. And so it's a forward thinking mindset where um, there's, no, there's no guilt in that, but I, I do look back to learn from it. And as, as Michael said, to look at the choices I made that contributed to the situation and then what I might do differently moving forward. So it's a very different mindset. One is kind of protecting the ego and his, and his uh, past focus. The other is about being the best I can be and his future focused. Hmm. There's a set of questions I ask most every guest that I have slated for later if we have time. And one of them, I actually use the phrase, let's see, how did I say it? Um, connecting with other like-minded people on a regular basis who can encourage you, challenge you, and help hold you accountable. And I took that phrase out when I realized who I was talking to. <laughs> I need to change that going forward, how I word that, because because your book is helping me wrap my head around how, how that's, yeah. that's really not the way to think about it. It's interesting because that is the prevailing notion and that's all we've ever been taught. It's, that's, what we've, that's what we've seen role modeled and everything else, this notion of holding others accountable. And, and the challenge with that is kind of back to the consequence model. What it means is that when, when someone doesn't do what they're supposed to do, I create a negative consequence. And, and Michael mentioned consequences shape behavior. You know, If you're performing well, the consequence model is great because you get the positive consequences. You get the praise, you get the recognition. Uh, the problem is, is when you when you start to struggle, then leaders move in or parents or whatever, whatever the person in authority is, moves in with these negative consequences. And that's what the notion of holding people accountable means. When you think about it, it means, okay, when they don't do what we're supposed to do, you got to get after them, whether that's a verbal chewing out or whether it's more severe than that. And there's significant downside to that. One of which is you get minimum performance. Mm. Right? I mean, think about that, Jeff. You get just enough to stop the consequences so that you go away. And, and that's that's bad enough, but it comes with collateral damage as well. Damage to the relationship, sometimes 
you know, damage from passive resistance to outright sabotage. So that notion of holding people accountable is based on the incorrect view of accountability as consequences. And it's the only thing we've ever been taught and learned <laughs> and, and really experienced. And that should put the minds of leaders at ease who are worried that they might lose the ability to influence performance, right? What you just said, I think, responds to that directly. You talk a bit about sort of a Stephen R. Covey idea, this idea of beginning with the end in mind when it comes to holding ourselves accountable. Michael, if you would walk us through what that, what that looks like, starting at the end and working our way backward. Well, you know, what are you accountable to, right? One of the questions we start off with the book is, where is accountability? Where, what is the edge of accountability? And where's the healthy edge of accountability? Everybody's got probably a different edge, but we, we are not responsible for everything that occurs in the world. And you know, sometimes people try to take on too much of that. So it's important to, to understand where accountability ends and where, where it begins for you. But once you understand that, then the other part of it is, is where are you going? What's important? What, why are you doing what you're doing? Where is it that you want to be in life? What's the vision you have for, for your life? Well, professionally and personally, the whole life, right? And given that vision that you, you have, what you want to be, what you want to create, then there's certain decisions that move you in that direction. And there's decisions that don't move you in that direction. And as you take those decisions, and you don't always know which the best decision is. I mean, sometimes you're making educated guesses, but the world will tell you, right? So if you take this action and this happens, well, maybe that wasn't the right action. Maybe you should try the other one and then something better happens. So it's iterative, but but it's it's consistently making the best choices available to you to accomplish what's most important to you in life. And that that's the, the engine that drives accountability is that we look at the degrees of freedom we have and, and the things that we control are the way that we think and the way that we behave. We don't control external events. And you know, as long as we focus on what we can control and we take the appropriate actions, you know, we're, we're doing our best. And that's, I think, the, the kind of the premise behind the way we look at accountability. Well, let's move from, from individual to leader here. Uh, for leaders, what does it mean to hold their, their teams accountable? In other words, how does the company model differ from the individual rat model, which we haven't even talked about yet? Maybe you can expound on that a bit, Brian. Yeah. So the, the, the rat model you're referencing is that it's this framework that says, look, our, our, our results are driven by our actions and our actions are driven by our thinking. And there's so many things that influence our thinking from the way we were raised to our goals and desires, to the weather, to the traffic, to all of that stuff. But as Michael points out, you know, the two things we control are our thinking and our actions. And ultimately, our thinking is what creates our results in life. And so, so much of life is between the ears, right? It's about the mindset. And that's why having the proper view of accountability matters as a leader, right? If I hold the traditional view of accountability as consequences, then I use consequences Consequences, in particular, negative consequences to try and manipulate and force behavior. And that's where we get minimal performance. That's where we get collateral damage. And so, you know, we talk about in the book, stop trying to hold your team accountable. You're actually preventing them from performing. Instead, hold them capable. And, you know, that may sound like semantics, but it's subtly and profoundly different all at the same time in that um, when we hold our team capable, we confront, but we don't confront out of the gate with consequences. We confront with freedom, freedom of choice. And then what are the natural consequences of those choices? And, and so sometimes leaders hear that and they think, well, that's really passive or I don't, I don't have standards. Not at all. I mean, we have very high standards, but people still have choice in that. They could choose to work somewhere else. Um, so it's getting the, the associates to recognize that as a leader, what I do with them is really predicated on the choices they make. They make productive, healthy choices. They're going to get praised. They're going to get rewarded. They're going to get promoted. And they make unproductive choices. And then what happens is just the opposite. You know, at some point, they're going to, they're going to work somewhere else. And, and it's the recognition of that, as Michael was alluding to, it's it's the natural flow of that. It's, it's organic. It's not forced. I, as the leader, I'm not just pulling the strings and saying, okay, today I don't, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to punish you for this or that because you didn't do it. And so it's a very different view. Mike, Mike, jump in. I know you have some thoughts on it too. When people hear us say consequences are not part of a performance model, they clearly are. Um, there was a book written a number of years ago by David H. Maester, who wrote The Trusted Advisor or co-wrote. And in that book, it was called uh, Practice What You Preach. And in that book, he talked about a uh, study he did on, on companies where he was looking at the cultural aspects of the company, what drove performance, what aspects of the culture drove performance. And obviously, the thing he found that was most powerful was quality and client relationships. And that that really drove results. But what drove client relationships and, and quality was um, high standards. 
empowerment. And so those two pieces, high standards was the expectation and empowerment was the ability to make choices, personal choices about how I'm going to accomplish those, those goals within the context of the rules, right? So, mm-hmm. so it was really a powerful eye-opening piece there where, where it's very confrontative. It, it talks about what the expectations are. People who are not meeting standards are not long-lived in those organizations. And yet they've all taken ownership and they support one another and, and they reject <laughs> low performers without even the boss getting involved very often. So mm-hmm. that model of, of performance, I want to really reiterate, is not um, namby-pamby. It's not soft. It, it's definitely confronted, it's confronting people with their choices and letting them understand that they're choosing their consequences. Talk about the work that you guys do, the workshops that you lead, the ways you work with companies. Uh, I thought particularly helpful in the book was the many examples that you're able to take from that work you do, real life examples to drive your, your points home. Yeah. So I, I think it starts whether, you know, whether they're just reading the book or, or the work we do, it starts with the, the thinking, the mindset shift of accountability away from consequences. And again, I want to reiterate consequences shape behavior. And as a leader, you're going to apply consequences, but, mm-hmm. but really understanding that you can't force someone to do something. And you might create a consequence that's so distasteful that they choose to do it, but that's where the collateral damage comes in. That's where the minimal performance comes in. And so the first word, is just shifting the mindset, the thinking around what accountability is and what it isn't, because our actions are driven by our thinking. So as long as I think that I can manipulate through consequences and that accountability is consequences, then you know there's a set of actions that go with that. As soon as I realize that accountability is based on free will choice, then as a leader, I begin to confront with choice. I do work around vision. I understand what people want. I try and connect the dots between how they succeed here in in the role they're in and how that enables a successful life for them and and set them up to make productive choices and coach them when they do and coach them when they don't. And so it's a much more partnership role, if you will, than it is a boss subordinate or or someone in authority sort of lording it over folks. Mm. I wrote a book uh, last year, my first, Uh, hopefully it will be an nth as successful as your books are at some point, a book that espouses the intentionality of, of consistent reading called Read to Lead. And one of the things I talk about in there is as leaders, we have to we have to set the example. Others have to catch us reading if that's a habit that we want those we lead to pick up. Michael, talk a bit about how some leaders can, as, as you guys say, create an, an accountable shadow. It's a great question. I mean, reading and giving yourself permission to read gives your team permission to read. Um, and so the same thing works with accountability. Any cultural characteristic you're trying to instill in support is affected by what you say and more often by what you do. So what you do has to be consistent with what you say. And so one of the things that we encourage leaders to do is to be accountable themselves first, to show that model of accountability. And so what that means in practical terms is is that instead of blaming other managers for something that didn't happen, um, they, they take ownership of the things that they did that contributed to that. And um, they don't let their team hear them blaming other managers. They don't blame individuals on the team for their personal failures. So I'd be more successful, except that you guys don't do your jobs. You know, that kind of conversation is, is really limited because if you, if you speak like that, then it just creates a space for your team to do the same thing. So behaving in a way that's really consistent with your values of, of, of accountability is ownership. The other thing is, as Brian said, is that when you when you have conversations around performance with people, I realize that they're adults, <laughs> they're your peers. They're in, in a sense, you may, they may report to you, but they're not children that you can you can just tell what they have to do and then they have to go to do it and you punish them if they don't. It's 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 almost a peer to peer conversation, mm-hmm. and you're talking not about what they're not doing right, but you're talking about what the goals are that they have. You come up alongside them and say, "These are these are the things that you said you wanted to create here, and I want to help you do that." That's my role is to, is to get things out of your way to help you be more successful. And here's some things that I'm seeing. What are your thoughts? And so it's it's a question based conversation. It's not me telling them what's wrong with them that they've got to fix. It's really a discovery conversation around what's keeping you from accomplishing those things. And then there's an agreement about what they're going to do differently post the conversation to to make efforts to, to close the gap that exists between where they want to be and where they are. So that it's really much more of a coaching partner relationship than it is a, a, a superior inferior kind of relationship that comes from the industrialized you know approach to running businesses. Brian, I want to ask you, I've got a couple of questions for you guys uh, in the time we have left, not directly related to the book. Uh, what have we not talked about from uncommon accountability that you would like to, to add? You know, I think the, 
The reason we wrote the book is because, as you mentioned, we had a couple chapters in in 12-week year, and as we began working with that, people wanted more, and we just saw that this was a, a, a huge gap. And so I think as you begin to understand accountability for what it is, I think it's probably the most empowering concept you have to live your best life and, and be uncommon. And so I don't know, Mike, is there anything? Yeah, a couple of things I, I'd say, and I, we've talked around them, but, but specifically, when you, when you coach to accountability, when you lead to accountability, you create an accountable culture. And the leader in, in a consequence management system has got a lot of a lot of work just keeping up with where people are and how to apply consequences to shape behavior. There's a lot of work to that. But when you have an accountable team that's taking ownership, they're making the decisions that you'd be making. They're they've taken on board how to how to make good choices. They don't need you to help them do that as much. So it frees up your time. So the, the power of, a, of an accountable culture is incredible. But the, the downside is, is there's a short-term cost to driving from a consequence-based model to an accountable model because the consequences do create certain levels of performance. And you know, your team, your team's used to that. So when you begin to change that behavior, there's gonna there, there might be some shorter term costs with people as they learn the ropes of this process, but the long-term payoff is more than more than worth it. But but people don't like short-term costs and long-term payoffs. It's not a good equation for most people. So sometimes that keeps managers from from uh, following through on the process. You know, it's it's interesting, Michael, you mentioned that because I've got I've got a client happens to be in uh, a real estate broker and hiring some new agents and really had this training program, had him, um, had him in the office, you know, working certain hours. And when COVID hit, he was really struggling to get him back in the office as quick as he could because he didn't have the oversight. And, and as we dug into that, what we realized was he's created a culture of dependency, right? They, they only work when he's looking over their shoulder. And, and so he was looking, he was asking me, how do, how do I get them back in the office? And, or how, how can I see what they're doing from a performance standpoint? And I said, well, the bigger issue for you, the underlying issue is they don't have ownership. If they had ownership, you wouldn't need to look over their shoulder all the time. You wouldn't need to necessarily be on top of all their numbers. They'd report their numbers. They'd share them with you. They'd ask for help. And so the conversation, when Mike talks about culture, what I, what I was working with him on was shifting the way he interacts with people so that he really created ownership on their part, which ultimately made his job easier and the t- team performed much better. But that's, what, that's the difference between a consequence culture, which most organizations have, mm-hmm. and an ownership culture, which is rare. As I've uh, interviewed authors these last uh, nine years, and I was a broadcaster 26 years prior to that. And so I've, I've done my share of interviews. And as I have, I've kind of highlighted, especially these last nine or so years, five things that I have found most of my guests seem to have in common. And the first one uh, you address directly in not only uncommon accountability, but also in the 12-week year, there's, there's a section in the chapter on holding ourselves accountable called move out of your comfort zone. Uh, Habit one is something I call dance with discomfort. And and to that, in the 12-week year, I just opened it today and found a note that I'd written, something I'd highlighted several years ago when I first read it. And it was this sentence, and I've got all these like notes around it and star asterisks and everything else. The number one thing that you will have to sacrifice to be great, to achieve what you're capable of and to execute your plans is your comfort. Uh, I'll start with you, Michael. Expound on that idea, if you would. Well, first of all, I just want to let you know that I was hoping it was one of my thoughts because I was going to hammer Brian for that. But it says that's 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 something that he came up with. I love I love it, and I'm jealous of it. But yeah, the the, the fact is is that some things we like to do, we enjoy doing, and they they come naturally to us. And so we tend to spend more time there than the areas in our life where we're not is having as much joy or not as competent, or we feel less comfortable taking action because of the potential risks that we perceive. And so typically the things that we're doing well, we're doing too much of that and we're not doing enough of the things. So in a sense, that discomfort is is an arrow that points at where the real opportunities are to take that leap in performance, because the things that I'm not doing, if I start to do those, um, typically that's what's been slowing me down and holding me back. And so being willing to sacrifice your comfort, as Brian says, be comfortable with being uncomfortable is, I think, a key key thing. What would you add to that, Brian? Anything? You know, if you're going to get a different result in any area of your life, you're going to have to do something you haven't done before. Mm -hmm. So every time you do that, there's discomfort, there's uncertainty, there's anxiety. It's the willingness to enter into that. 
and I think for a lot of folks, you, you know, I, I think sometimes um, I was looking through the questions and one of them is what's your favorite book? And one of my favorite books is Feel the Fear and Do It Anyways by Susan Jeffers. You know, because I, I do think there's this tendency to look at other people that are doing something or, or accomplishing things that I'm not and think that they're fearless when in fact, you know, they had to work through the same discomfort that you're going to have to work through to master that. And so I don't think you sacrifice values. I don't think you sacrifice integrity. I don't think you sacrifice family or health or sanity, but but you're going to sacrifice your comfort to be great because you're going to have to do things you haven't done before. And you're going to have to step out on new ground and that's uncomfortable. And, you know, typically you're a little uncertain with it. You know, confidence comes from competence, competence comes from reps. And so you got to get out there and you, and, and you got to do it, which means mm. that notion of leaning into that discomfort versus away from it. Well, he jumped ahead just a little bit on me, Michael. So I'll ask you this question now too. I love it. I love it. That's a, a fantastic book. Uh, let me ask you for maybe a book, a recommendation or two. One of the books I really like is The Answer to How Is Yes. Uh, Peter Kostenbaum and Peter Block wrote that book. And in it is a lot of deep thinking about what it, what it is to be human, what it is to accomplish things in your life, what it is to confront areas where you're not comfortable. And, and I really like that book. I think it's a powerful book. Uh, I know with all that's gone on in the last couple of years, uh, many of us have had things like routines and rituals disrupted. The world is much different than it was a couple of years ago. But Michael, do you have any sort of morning ritual or morning routine? As I've talked to, to leaders and successful people over the years, it seems that most have some kind of consistent ritual. Uh, if so, how does yours tend to unfold? Well, that's a great question. And um, as I was working through COVID, I actually began to experiment with my own personal routines. And so I started getting up at five in the morning. Mm. Uh, and I'm sorry, four in the morning, got up at four o'clock in the morning. By five, I was in my office. And um, you know, the first thing I do every morning was put my feet on the floor. And as soon as I felt the floor on my feet, I said, okay, another great day. I did. I met my commitment here. And it just was a powerful way to start the day with a positive. And that worked really well for me because between you know, five o'clock and eight o'clock in the morning, nobody's calling you. Most people don't start calling you until around 10. So you have this big block of time that's really yours. You can use to do what you want to do with it. And we were writing the book and, and that's one of the real benefits that I got from that. But the thing is, and I, so I'm in between routines right now because one of the things that, because I'm married, my wife wasn't as crazy about was me getting up at four o'clock because then I was going to bed at about eight thirty nine o'clock at night, and so everything had to be quiet, and it became kind of this, this, this different worldviews and in, in uh, conflict there. So, so I've, I'm modifying that at the moment. Yeah, I did morning radio for a six year period, and getting up at three is not fun. Going to bed at seven, yeah, it's uh, not something I wanted to do long term for sure. Brian, yeah. let me go to you with that with that same question with regard to uh, routines and rituals, especially in the morning. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, Michael and I did a workshop on the difference between habits and routines. And, mm. you know, I think it's I think it's important to understand that in spite of what people tell you, not everything can turn into a habit. And so mm. the the things that you find difficult, you have to turn into routines. And so the morning routine is one of those. Mm. I'm spiritual based, so I start with scripture. That's where I start mm. my day and some prayer. Then I'm gonna read something or listen to something that's encouraging. Um, we've moved to Arizona. So the thing we've added is my wife and I have been walking in the mornings before it gets light and the sky is just amazing. And so there's just some some quiet time. We'll talk about what we read in scripture and just talk about our day. So that that, you know, finding a routine for you in the morning that sets up your day to be great. You know, I've just started with my daughter. I'll ask her when I'll see her in the morning. She's she's 16. I'm like, how are you today, Emma? And what I want to hear from her is good. It's going to be a great day, dad. And, <laughs> yeah. and uh, b- because, you know, you, you got to declare to the world and declare to yourself that it's mm-hmm. going to be a great day. And, and, and so the morning routine doesn't have to take hours. It doesn't have to be big. Yeah. You know, Michael put his feet on the ground and said, it's going to be a great day. That's, that's, that's a routine that can make a huge difference in your day. So I don't want your listeners mm-hmm. to think, oh, you got to carve out hours for this morning routine. Right. In fact, more than likely, it's probably unproductive, right? But find a routine that starts your day with with positivity and puts your mind, right? The thinking, because that's going to drive your actions. Get your mind in the right, in the right frame. So we've been talking with uh, Brian Moran and Michael Lennington, the new book, Uncommon Accountability, A Radical New Approach to Greater Success and Achievement. Guys, thank you so much for your time and for being here today. I really appreciate it. It was great being with you. Appreciate you having us. Absolutely. A lot of fun. I have included several resources and links on the blog posts associated with this episode. Those things include links, of course, to the book 
Also, the book, The 12 Week Year. I wrote a summary several years back on The 12 Week Year. I'll include a link to that. You can download it for free at my website. And of course, I'll include links to the books that Michael and Brian recommended. You can find all of that at readtoleadpodcast.com slash 420 for episode 420. No jokes, Elon Musk, if you're listening. That's readtoleadpodcast.com slash 420. You know, I've mentioned before that the 12 week year is one of my favorite productivity books of all time. Another one that I read recently that I really, really liked is called Redeeming Your Time, written by Jordan Rayner. He'll be my guest on the show in exactly two weeks. Next week, it's Mark Miller, the Vice President of High Performance Leadership at Chick fil A. His new book, Smart Leadership for Simple Choices to Scale Your Impact. Again, that's next time. Hope to see you next time. Until then, as always, remember, leaders read and readers lead. Read.